Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast from Birkin Law about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. There's something I've noticed about nonprofit founders working through their tax exemption application. They hit the narrative statement section and they get stuck. For whatever reason, they've been so amped about their mission in their head this whole time. But something happens when they try to put it on paper, exactly what they're going to do and how it will all work. They just need help. Today's guest is one of my startup clients who was in that exact spot. And in this episode, he agreed to let you all in on the session where I help him get unstuck. Stay tuned. My name is Tommy Hoffman, and I am the founder of Sober Farms. Hey, Tommy. Thanks for being here. It's so awesome that we get to do this in a podcast form. So just so our listeners know, you're my client, and I'm your lawyer, and we are working on the tax exemption application for Sober Farms. And something interesting happened the other day where you were kind of working with Megan, who works with me on trying to craft this narrative statement and you you were feeling maybe a little bit stuck. And I said to Megan, she was relaying to me what was going on. I said, you know, we should have Tommy on the podcast because this is so common for people starting a nonprofit. They get to this point where it's like, we're going to tell the IRS all the things and it's just really hard. So I thought maybe we could kind of walk through your application materials, and I could maybe help you frame up some of the ideas for your narrative. What do you think? Love it. Okay, awesome. So I took a look at the stuff that you were working on with Megan, and I will say the first thing that jumped out to me from one of the the first documents I looked at was like, you are a natural copywriter. Like, a lot of what you're, and I mean that as a compliment. Will you call? Um, will you call my mother and tell her that I'm a natural at something? I I will. <laughs> I love the like you have several stories in here. Like meet Dave. This is his story, and this is this is why you know he's a great fit for Sober Farms and how we can help him. Meet Sarah, right? And these stories all are like fulfill like a persona and it's great fundraising copy, but I think where we got stuck here is it's too good. It's too, it's too great of writing. It's a great piece for a fundraising case statement, but it's not necessarily getting into those nitty gritty. Like the IRS just wants to see what do you do? What, how does it work? Why is it charitable? And so Um, I love when people get stuck in this direction, though, because it means that you're capable of writing more than two paragraphs about your mission. (laughs) I could write I could write thousands of paragraphs about my mission. That's one of one of my major concerns. But and also for disclosure, full disclosure, I did take the case for support draft that I've been working on and literally just copied it over. So it is is, the intention of that document is a case for support because I'm so eager to start raising money and I'm so eager to start, you know, serving the mission. That I'm that, you know, I got stuck in the what I like to call the boring stuff. Scary well, stuff too. Yeah. And frankly, thank God you're stuck there because most people just are like, well, once I get the C3 status, then the money shows up. And you know that that's no, not and, true. You know, it's funny is that I, I actually had this all planned. I had this very poetic vision in my head of getting my case for support a little bit, you know, mostly secured. And then st- and then I was going to go visit some friends, one of whom is a um, wealth manager for a lot of very wealthy individuals. And I, I had, I had put myself into a position where I was going to give him the story. Here's what I've been doing during COVID. Here's what I've been doing during the pandemic. And here's, what has been giving me a lot of passion and love and excitement around it. And as expecting after, you know, and blah, 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 sober farms. And then I was ready for him to say, great, I'm going to get you $10 million. Instead, he said, that's great. Good luck. <laughs> And I was like, what do you mean? There's not, you don't just take my throw money at me. So you, you do, even though you're starting down this road, I, you have this, these 
visions of grandeur. And then you got to remember that there's these little bits and pieces that I got to do. And I think that not to, you know, placate and toot your horn, but your process is fantastic because it's, it's fantastic. And it's also scary because I'm, I'm going to places that I just, I, I know I can trust you and I know I can put my trust in the process with you. It's just a really hard place when you're enthusiastic kind of nonprofit entrepreneur who just wants to get started. Right. Yeah. I, want, I want to hit the ground running. So your point yeah. about get the C status and boom, raise money. Doesn't work that way. So and you have a lot to be excited about. Like I get jazzed up when I think about like working on this with you. So can you give us the elevator speech for Sober Farms so everybody's on the same page with how cool this mission is? Absolutely. So the the elevator speech, which would be a really long elevator ride because I'm chatty. So I had a vision a while back of buying a coffee farm in Hawaii. It was a, a weekend vision of like, wouldn't it be cool to just have a coffee farm? And uh, uh, that turned into a coffee Zen farm. Then that turned into, and I'm not even that much of a Zen guy. I'm <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no, I'm so not. And then it turned into, well, I read this article about this guy who had a, a farm for you know Zen and sober people and clean living and so forth. And then. Uh, there's another long securitist route to get to this, which is Sober Farms is a place for people to get their act back together and learn the fundamentals of what it means to have humility and provide service and do ha- and to instill the vital tools that come for, with sustained sobriety. And, you know, I say in my case for support that treatment is a stopgap, and that's not even my line. That's someone else's line. And and it's a great, you know, real sobriety comes from the the days, weeks, months, and years following treatment. And we can go from treatment to a halfway house. We can go from a halfway house to a sober house where you, you go about your daily business, but you come home to a place that is around sober people. But what about the person who has lost it all? It could be a lawyer who got disbarred, lost their family. If they know you, they owe you. And they just don't even have the confidence, the self-confidence to just get a job, just to start from zero and understand. You know, my friend John said to me when I told him about this idea, he, he, he grew up on a farm. and He said, Tommy, I've been using farm metaphors my entire sobriety. He's got 25 years of sobriety. He said, corn doesn't grow in a day. Corn grows one day at a time. What a great metaphor. The animals need to be fed regardless of what kind of shit is going on in our lives. And so I think there's a great amount of tools that can come with the fundamental metaphors that come with farming. Number one. Number two is personally, I love the idea of working with my hands and seeing something come as a result of it and caring for something and serving something the earth the crop, the the animal, and then ultimately after harvest or butcher (laughs) or slaughter, I should say, whatever it may be, ultimately giving back. I'm giving back. I'm feeding clean. I have, it's an organic farm. That's another thing. Silver farms will be an organic farm and hopefully sustainable as much as sustainable, as sustainable as we can be. Clean, giving back. It, that's just, there's no other way to slice that pie. And so When I tell people about sober farms and what it will be or what it could be, and there's a whole bunch of little nuances, you can see people. They automatically go to, oh, it just writes itself. It just makes a lot of sense. Even without, I I have a hard time articulating it sometimes, but people will just start to nod, say, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. Furthermore, I think that once someone understands that they have a job and they can do that job and show up every day, just like in their life where they left a wake of damage behind them. They can only rebuild trust. You know, right now we're in the month in in September, which is the ninth month of the year. You follow the steps monthly. We're in the ninth step, which is making amends to people. And sometimes that's building back trust. Trust doesn't come back saying, hey, I'm 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 all good now. I've been through rehab. Everything's good. Trust comes from little steps, little proof, little moves along the way. And then the people you love or the people who love you can start to trust you again, but it has to, it, you have to sweep your side of the street. You have to show up every day and do the work. And I think that's really the the poetic metaphor of 
of Sober Farms. And uh, I am just so excited by this idea and what I see can come of it. You know, I, I, my vision, my long-term vision, and I'll end with this, is someday I'm sitting in some fancy restaurant in some town, not even Minneapolis, where we are, but let's just say it's Chicago or New York or Kansas City. And on the bottom of the menu, it says, all of the herbs are provided by Sober Farms, Missouri. And Sober Farms is a place where sober people learn to give back and restart their lives. And the day I see that, or the day that some one person comes up to me and says, Tommy, or whomever, farm supervisor, whoever it may be, and I hear about it, thank you. This, this made me understand that I, I can do it. I, I can do it. And I just need the, the gift of the program and then tools like this that will help enhance it. That's what Sober Farm says to me. Yeah. Yes. It does write itself. <laughs> it does write. It's so great. And I get it's, choked up. I mean, I honestly. I know. It's I, so I, I good. Get, I feel like this is, I said this to my wife the other day. I think this is one thing where she didn't roll her eyes. Usually she does. You know, behind every clown of a man, there's a, a, a wife who's rolling her eyes. But I said to her, I said, I honestly feel like this comes to me as a place of a calling. It's something that I need to do. And there's going to be competition. And someone said to me, like, I heard about another. I'm like, yeah, great. All these places are doing things to better the world. Why is that competition? My for-profit life, you know, I'd be have a different reaction. Oh, shit. What are we going to do? You know? It's just market it, validation, though. Other people yeah. doing the same business model means that this works. It's viable. And there's demand. So it, I, <laughs> I'm never worried about that. No. And I, but that is, I mean, it's still, you know. Right, but your program won't be a great fit for everybody. It'll have its it own personality. It it'll and have its be, own culture. And there'll be limitations, right? I can only hire, you know, I can only hire so many people to work the farm. I can have volunteer events, but I can only hire so many people. Right. So let's talk about some of the programs. So the work program, what does that look like in your mind? In my, in my brain? <laughs> in my brain, the work program comes in multiple functions. One is the fundamental, the rudimentary, the, the entry level, right? The person who either A is just so, like I said, the wake of damage is so great that they just need to start over. And they're going to come to Sober Farms with probably some sobriety behind them, maybe limited. And they are going to start with working in the fields. They are a hand. You start as a farm hand. If you fast forward that person and the program works, that person then can maybe someday, if they let's say they're the farmhand for the for the uh, <laughs> I don't know let's let's make something up the edible flower greenhouse okay and let's say they're just work that's all they do they, every day they go and they manage the weed infiltration and they manage the soil counts whatever it might be and that they do that job and they do that job every day and they do it to the best of their ability and they do it with care and concern before you know it that person might very well become the edible flower greenhouse manager, and they're overseeing two people. All of a sudden, this person who couldn't even hold a job, who's damaged every relationship behind them, now understands that if I show up every day, I do the next right thing, and I sweep my side of the street, and I be responsible for the things that aren't always easy for me, I get, yeah. I get to excel. So that's the work program for me. I think that's the gist of it. How do you transition them from farm work to outside world work? So the farm will have a farm supervisor, someone who is very, very educated in agroecology, organic farming, sustainable farming, what have you. And then we'll have down to channel managers, right? So let's just pretend it's the crop manager or the livestock manager, whatever it might be. And then that those hands and they work their way. You can work your way up. Once you reach a certain point, let's say you're, you know, you're not an ag, you don't have ag education if you no, will. I mean, you have to graduate from the program at some you point. Yeah, you so graduate from what, the program. And, that, and then all of a sudden you have a resume. You have something on your resume that I had this job where I started at zero mm -hmm. and I ended up as a channel manager. And here's a reference. And I showed up to work every day. And, I, and you can go apply for any job in America <laughs> that would, you know, that, that would actually look for a clean record of showing up and doing your job and doing it to the best of your ability. So the graduation out of the program is 
you know, it could be six months, it could be a year, it could be two years. And yet to be determined on how we function that through in that timeline. But ultimately, you graduate out with two things, a resume or a line item on your resume that has that is robust and can have very clear responsibilities and executions and successes. And then two, and most importantly, what's in here, what's inside and the, and the, and the, the confidence and, and then, and the knowledge that I can do it. Yeah. And I might screw up tomorrow, but I know how to, I know how to write the ship now instead of screwing up and then starting to go down this road, which is my history, which is my path. Seems like there's some support that would need to come in the graduation process because that's like, you know, it's a big life change to go from I'm in this kind of like safe bubble where everyone is sober to I'm going to transition out to a job that it's not the same. So I'm going to have challenges. I'm going to be around people that aren't sober that are inviting me to happy hour. So is there any sort of like in your head, like a continuation of services to help them get through that transition? Or is it just making sure they get set up with, okay, here's the AA group that you're going to go to. You're going to your meetings, that sort of thing. I don't see it. I don't see it as that hands-on. I think that, I think it's going to be a little bit more organic in that programming element. You know, my, my, uh, my 14 year old son, sometimes the wisdom comes from the young, right? My 14 year old son said to me, he said, dad, I have a, I have an idea. Why don't you get people who have a lot of sobriety under their belt to work the farm too? And if they're working next to somebody with with new sobriety, that wisdom, that experience, strength, and hope that they can share, he didn't say it that way, will teach them more than anything that they can oh, yeah. do it. So I think that I understand what you're asking, but I think that the graduation is more organic. So that's good. That's a little wrinkle that we just revealed there about the program. So that's really great. So what about the organic farming? Talk about that a little bit. Okay. Well, two things. One is it's a personal belief, right? I think we have a responsibility to our climate and to our future generations. And uh, organic farming tends to that, number one. Number two, it's also teaching us to eat clean. <laughs> think, of the, think of the alcoholic or, the, or the, the addict who's coming in. I promise you, you know, I say this in, that, in, your, in the case for support. No one comes in on a winning streak, the AA, their sobriety. And... Let's just take diet for one exam- minor example, and they're not eating clean. They're, they, I mean, by and large, I'm sure there are stories, but by and large, they're not eating clean. That's not their primary concern. Primary concern is where, what's next and where do I get it? So organic farming to me just fundamentally makes a lot of sense. Number two is this is a personal, uh, but we have a responsibility to our climate and our communities. And I want to produce clean food. I want to produce clean product. Furthermore, I think there's also another cool little ancillary program that we can offer, which is also another job that we can put inside the farm, putting together, the, you know, there's another farm that did this once where they took old buses and they turned them into markets and they took their product and they went into food deserts. You know, there's, there's, there's categorized food deserts in and amongst our communities. Actually, the census and the Opportunity Zone census did that same thing. They understand and did an overlay of where food deserts are. Yeah. Here locally, I actually went to grad school with that woman, Leah Porter, who started that here. Oh, awesome. I'll introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> when I heard about that, I thought that's a brilliant idea. In order, there's no reason that Sober Farms shouldn't have its own market. And that w- that's giving back. I mean, A, we're helping. And B, we're giving back. You know, that's that's we're doing something to better, teaching someone how to eat a better diet. And so does that look like a cost share, kind of like a traditional CSA, or is it more like a food bank where you give away food in the food deserts? Uh, haven't thought that one through yet. Okay. I would think that it would be probably a cost share. I, I would I would think that, you know, my, my, listen, the long range plan financially for the organization is that each farm becomes financially self-sustaining, right? The capital, the capital fundraising is at the beginning. The capital fundraises for, you know, acquisition of the farm itself and the capital equipment necessary to operate it and perhaps, you know, funding the farm supervisor. But then after a, you know, we've done a couple of financial models where it would be a two to three year process where each farm relatively financially self-sustaining 
And then our job as a board would be to go out and fundraise again and have another capital venture for the next farm in the next state or the next community, whatever it might be. Right on. So then I see there's this partnerships with food insecurity orgs you have down here. That's where that was my that was the food desert comment I just made, right? Okay. That was, so that's related to that. Yes, and that was the intent of that of that line. So is there anything else we're missing? Other things that would happen that are programs of the organization? You mentioned restaurants and selling produce to restaurants. Right. I mean, ultimately, the product is, you know, listen, in my grand vision dream, and I think achievable, is I'm going to walk through Lunds one day and there's going to be on some shelf a bottled product or a packaged product and it's going to say Sober Farms. And so what is Sober Farms? It's a nonprofit. Anything you do is giving money back to supporting the benefit of Sober Farms itself and getting sober people a chance to reignite what what they have inside them because i promise you they have it inside them they just got to find it and uh and that's my job that's how i see sober farms is my job to go help them find that and achieve that goal you know i I have pretty grand vision around that and around like restaurants as an example and the community give back i think restaurants often are a great example especially fancy restaurants can be a great example of they want to there's a there's some social currency that you get in giving back and I think that from everything from a restaurant to Delta Airlines will do it. Like I see it that is another thing that someone could come into sober farms and they may start as a farmhand in a field and they could end up being the marketing manager for partnerships outside of this. I mean, like, <laughs> I, I see a robust organization that will have a multitude of options from a programmatic standpoint, both in graduation and then listen, there's going to be relapse. There's going to be issues. There's going to be stuff that's going to happen on the farm. Just like, you know, you're in the real world, you're going to lose your job. But if you come back and you're making your amend and you're doing the next right thing, we don't shoot our wounded. We're going to give you a shot. We're going to give you a shot, but you need to understand that you are signing a contract to work. So I, I'm kind of a little all over the place there, but from the programmatic standpoint, that's still, we're still you know, honing in. And obviously this is that discussion. So is there any plan to provide housing or do folks just, they literally come to the farm to work every day? No, in a perfect world, we'll have a little bit of both. In a perfect world, let's pretend that a farm is a, a farm has 10 farm hands or 10 staff on farm. And I would love it if we could figure out a sober living facility that would house half of them, right? Five that come into the community, come in from the community or drive in or what have you. Or maybe they rent an apartment in the neighboring town and, and they're, they're starting there at their zero and that's what it is. And they come to work. But then there is a sober house as well and sober living facility. And until that time comes, is there an interim step? Do you partner with other sober houses to help their, you know, the people they're yeah. already housing? And, and yes, I mean, <laughs> that's a good in the, in the grand uh, vision of Tommy Hoffman, no, we're building that house right away and it's going to be filled. <laughs> right. So I, I, the other thing, too, is that, you know, can that sober house, you know, there's there's different licensing and, and some other different rules around sober living facilities. So that may actually have to be a completely separate entity, even though it'll be on the farm. Yeah, that's where I'm thinking, you know, initially partnering with other sober houses that are already like, you know, clicking away and doing Right. And I have a, obviously I've, I've been in the program for 26 years and have a number of contacts that, that, that are doing exactly what we just talked about. So is there, besides having, you know, either part-time or full-time employment, is, is there another way to get involved? Can you come and do a volunteer shift or what is, are there any other ways for people to get involved that are wanting to? Well, one thing that is really cool about a farm is that there's always work to be done. And uh, there's never enough people to do it all. And there are going to be, in my plan, harvesting events that will be great fundraising events and great, for lack of a better way to say it, get involved events. <laughs> so, that there, yes, there will be, I think, a, a number of ways to get involved because the more people that are going to be around the organization, especially sober people helping other sober people, that's the community that we're trying to not only enhance but prove that it can, it can help you. And I need it every day. I need that daily reminder every day. It's a daily reminder. <laughs> right on. 
Well, I think that if we were to run this um, audio recording through a transcriber, we would probably have your narrative statement all laid out. So sometimes I think the trick is just getting you to like actually talk about how you think it's going to work at first and in the future. And that's really sort of the trick to unlocking that narrative statement in my mind. Well, it's interesting. I, I, you know, like I told you ahead of this recording that it's a scary place to be for especially someone that is yeah, as type A and visual as I am. I, I can see the end. I, I'm a really, I have a great, I do a great job in my head of seeing the end. It's the work to get there, which is also for me, this is a therapy, right? It's practice what you preach, Tommy. Like you have a daily practice and whatever little move you make today is going to help you get to that visual to that end. And I, I just, I'm going to pull this off. Our board is going to pull this off. Everyone behind us is 100% in the game and sees the value that this can add to someone's life. Like I said, that one person who comes up to us that one day says, you showed me that I can do it. And for lack of a better way to say it, you saved my life. That's going to be a great day. It sure is. It's totally coming. Tommy, thank you so much for being here. This was awesome. And thank you for sharing your story and for helping other folks starting nonprofits hear your story on the, on the struggle of starting up because it's it's not easy. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much. All right, folks, that's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks, this podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice.